Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to New York City and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. My name is Ernest Sotomayor. I am the Dean of Student Affairs. And we want to uh, welcome you to our school. You are budding journalists. Some of many of you are very experienced, so we'll expect many, many questions from you. That'll be the norm. So fire away at any point you have a question. I would like to introduce our first speaker. It is a bit of a sad day for us because for the last 10 years he has been appearing to welcome both our admitted classes and those who have enrolled and come to us in, this, in the fall. Uh, this will be the last class that he will be uh, welcoming in advance of enrollment because he will be stepping down in July 1. But he's here today to speak to you, tell you a little bit about the school, its history, and what you can expect. Nick Lemon. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Nick Lemon, as, as Ernest said, and um, I have been uh, dean for the last 10 years. Um, I'm stepping down this summer. I'm actually going to be on sabbatical next year, so uh, I will be uh, available to talk to anybody in this room up through July, but then uh, if you are here as a student next year, you're not going to see a lot of me, and I'll be back the following year as a faculty member. Um, so I just want to tell you um, a little bit about the school as a sort of general introduction, and then more people will be speaking to you. I'll be here again tomorrow morning. Um, and if anybody wants to have an individual meeting with me, just email me, let me know. Um, it's my last name, L-E-M-A-N-N, -N, at columbia.edu. Um, and also, after I speak for a little while, um, I'm available, we'll do, if, if you all want to do some Q&A, uh, we can do that too. So let me start with some general orientation. Um, and first, I'll tell you the story of where the school came from. So you see an oil portrait over there uh, that is partially obscured by this screen. Um, that's a picture of the school's founder, Joseph Pulitzer. Um, the, uh, thank you. Um, this school has a very interesting history and story behind it. We, we this year have been celebrating our centennial. The last official centennial event was last week ago today. We had 28 centennial events in the course of the academic year just ending. Um, so uh, a little bit about this. Joseph Pulitzer, um, in, in 1863, uh, those of you who've studied American history may know that there were draft riots in New York City, very bloody and terrible riots. And they were basically uh, people uh, rioting to show that they uh, were refusing a draft notice to serve in the Union Army in the Civil War. Um, as a result of that, uh, the government decided they had to uh, send recruiters to Europe with uh, suitcases full of cash to pay people to come and be mercenary soldiers in the Union Army in order to win the Civil War. And one such person was Joseph Pulitzer, who at the time was a 17-year-old uh, kid growing up in Hungary, didn't have any money and accepted a sort of bounty or cash payment to come to the United States to be a soldier in the Union Army. Um, he went on to have, um, you know, classic American success story. He, he wound up first in St. Louis, Missouri, um, where he was a politician, then a newspaper publisher of the, pu of the paper that is now the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Uh, in the early 1880s, he came to New York and bought a paper called The New York World, uh, which we, we've recently started republishing here, uh, from Jay Gould, the railroad robber baron. Um, Gould couldn't make the world work commercially. Pulitzer was an incredible uh, editorial genius and business genius and was able to turn the world into a huge uh, success. Um, 
he was really one of the very first people who figured out a way to make money in the newspaper business, or even more largely the news, the media business. Um, he was a great journalist uh, and a, a great uh, showman. Um, among the many things he thought of were uh, to build the tallest building in New York, which uh, the world building, which no longer exists, was for a while. It's where the on-ramp to the Brooklyn Bridge is now. Um, and then when the French government gave the Statue of Liberty to the United States, uh, Pulitzer knew who his market was, which was immigrants coming in to Ellis Island down in the New York Harbor. So he decided, well, I'll buy the uh, base on which the Statue of Liberty stands. So he paid for that. And uh, that allowed him to use the Statue of Liberty as a kind of personal logo for the New York world. And, and uh, uh, so he became a kind of the symbol of welcoming immigrants into New York City. Um, and that made the paper a big success. After about 10 years after he had bought the world, uh, Pulitzer had an idea which was um, original and not considered entirely sane at the time, which was that a great university should have a school to train journalists. Um, and not only that, but the journalists should be given prizes for distinguished work. So he came to Columbia University here in 1892 and said to the then powers that be, uh, I will give you a couple million dollars, which was real money back then, and uh, if you will start a series of prizes in a school of journalism. And Columbia said no. Um, he was very persistent, and he came back 10 years later in 1902. Um, Columbia had a new president then. Uh, Pulitzer had a, a, a technique to break down Columbia's resistance, which was saying that um, if he didn't give the money to Columbia, he would give the money to Harvard. Um, and Columbia changed its mind and said yes. So in 1903, there was a big announcement that Mr. Pulitzer had made a gift to Columbia to uh, create a school of journalism and to create a system of prizes for journalists. That's what, where the Pulitzer Prizes, which were announced last Monday, you know, uh, run in this building, came from. Um, a couple of things to add to that. Within about five seconds after the gift was announced, a fight broke out um, where a lot of journalists were saying, but you don't need to go to journalism school to be a journalist. And uh, they had a really strong argument at the time because there weren't any journalism schools. Um, and Mr. Pulitzer felt he had to defend himself, so he wrote a wonderful article called The School of Journalism. Um, in uh, what was then a very prominent sort of thought leader magazine called North American Review. Um, anytime you ever see a quote from Joseph Pulitzer, uh, it's from that article. Uh, there are many on different parts of our school. It's a wonderful article. We have lots and lots of copies. I highly recommend uh, that you read this article and or uh, look at old copies of the world, which we can show you as well, because it's a wonderful newspaper. Um, his dream was that uh, journalism should be elevated from a trade to a profession. Uh, he really believed that journalists were essential to uh, the, the healthy functioning of a democratic society. Pulitzer believed in the capabilities of ordinary people. That's what had made him rich, was publishing a paper based on that belief. Um, but he believed that journalists had to sort of explain the world to just regular people who weren't experts. So journalists should come to a university. They should learn how to practice the skills of journalism at a very expert level. And they should also learn how to understand complicated subjects. And then they would communicate all this information to the public. And then you'd have an informed public and a healthy democracy. And in addition, uh, the journalists involved would have a lot of fun because they'd be performing a, an essential service and one that involved a lot of uh, creativity and adventure and so on. Um, and so it was. Uh, so this school uh, opened its doors in the fall of 1912. Um, 
And ever since then, we've been kind of uh, the center of the never-ending debate about what journalism is, what journalism should be, um, and, and uh, what journalism school should be. Um, it's one of the reasons it's exciting to be here is if you're here in this room every single day, somebody is up speaking provocatively about something and ditto in the other room. It's named after Pulitzer's paper, the world room at the other end of the hallway. Um, we are the smallest of the, I believe, 19 schools at Columbia. We are the biggest by a huge margin purveyor of professional master's degrees in journalism in the world. Um, we will hand out uh, next month diplomas to 300 people maybe. Um, that's at about 10% of the world total of people getting uh, master's degrees in journalism, maybe even a little more than that. Um, so both the smallness relative to the rest of Columbia and the bigness relative to other graduate master's programs in journalism are big assets for this school. The smallness is an asset because um, we, compared to most of the rest of this university, we're a very intimate place. Um, most classes are uh, what my bosses over there would call uh, offensively small. Um, <laughs> 16 students is, is, and often with one teacher and one adjunct teacher, is, is a typical number. Um, so this is a school where you get a lot of individual attention from people who mostly are great journalists, mainly still practicing journalism when not teaching. Um, and and uh, they know your name and they know who you are. Uh, this, the, the bigness of the school compared to other journalism schools means that at a time of a lot of change in journalism, we're able to offer a, an unusually wide suite of courses, uh, of, of vari our, our faculty represents a really wide variety of skills and our curriculum a wide variety of material compared to what you can usually find at, at most of the graduate journalism programs, which are truly tiny. So as of this year, um, you know, we have 30 plus students in a new class um, on how to write algorithms. So in that particular class, instead of writing stories, you write algorithms. And, and that's a very uh, useful and needed skill in journalism today. And not a lot of schools can specialize enough that they can have a faculty member who can teach you how to write computer code, but we can. Um, so just about anything that's happening in journalism, uh, we have teaching capability in, including most of the things that have to do with the great digital revolution that's transforming journalism. Any subject you want to cover as a journalist, we can get you there. Um, we can, anything in the sort of visual journalism world, we can get you there. We now have a full-time uh, photojournalism uh, instructor for the first time in a long time. Um, so we combine a kind of intimacy with an unusually wide range of, of, uh, of material that we can teach. Because of our uh, size, our age, and our prominence, um, we're a, a really global institution. Um, there is no place in the world that you can go where there's journalism where there is, you won't bump into some Columbia Journalism grad or other and where the school's name doesn't have some resonance. So by coming here, you get to be part of a family that goes back in time and forward in time and spans a lot of distance. We now have 35 to 40 countries represented in our small school every year. Um, and, and as well as every, every kind of, of news organization you can imagine. Um, we're a school that has some scholars on the faculty, but most of our faculty, including me, uh, have spent most of our lives as practicing journalists, and most of us, also including me, continue to practice journalism. So we're uh, teaching 
from the point of view of people who also love journalism, it's what we've dedicated our own lives to, and, and the teaching is oriented toward doing. So we, not every single class in the school produces journalism. We teach, for example, history of journalism classes. It's very hard to do that in the form of having you write stories, but we do an enormous amount of journalism production in the school at a, at a very high level. So if a class can be oriented toward the students producing journalism uh, that can be published, and often we publish it ourselves, we will do that um, because that's what we all do and that's the core value of our community. Um, I want to uh, ask those who are on the payroll of the school in the room to raise your hand so I can introduce you to everybody and you'll be hearing from a bunch of these people over time. So uh, this is Christine Souders, uh, who runs the admissions office. This is Melanie Huff, the dean of students. This is uh, Ernest Sotomayor, dean of associate dean of student affairs. Julie Hartenstein, who uh, quickly becomes the most important person in your life if you're here, because she runs the job placement office and is, uh, uh, is, is the, your chief liaison uh, to the job market. Who else is in the room? You gotta help me with my eyesight. Can't. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, and Bill, is, he's not here. Taryn uh, is the financial aid person. Um, Brett also works in the admissions office. Um, you're gonna have lots of information about financial aid, which I know is a subject of high interest. Any faculty members here? There were a couple. No? Um, okay. They'll be back in a minute. Um, and uh, we have a very, very full program through today. I'll be back in the morning, uh, and we'll be kind of running through the days. Let me pause and ask if anybody has any questions or comments or anything. Yes. Hello, I'm Margo, I'm from Friends. Um, I have a quick question about, um, I heard, I read a paper about um, journalism school that are now teaching how to pilot drones. Um, I wanted to know if it's How to pilot drones? Yes. Yeah, we're not teaching that yet. Yeah. So no, yeah. because like more, like I heard like there's like five journalism schools in the country that are doing this, so I was thinking if like, do you, are you planning on having a class about this or no? Uh, there are no current plans to offer a class on how to pilot <laughs> drones. However, um, we are um, <laughs> we're doing all sorts of things I wouldn't have dreamed of 10 years ago when I came. Directly beneath where we are now um, where is a construction site um, where we're, we're taking uh, some older space in the school and turning it into the home of all of our sort of digital journalism operations. There's two big uh, gifts from, from donors uh, that, that whose names are associated with this. So this will be called the Brown Institute for Media Innovation, uh, and it also contains the Tau Center for Digital Journalism. What this really means is that our Primarily digital faculty will work down there, but it's kind of a big open space that will be filled with postgraduate fellows, um, people doing research, people taking classes, and they'll be, what we're doing, we're, we're not doing drones yet, but what we are doing is um, actually making what people call artifacts. Uh, we have a partnership now with the uh, Stanford Engineering School, they and we together operate the Brown Institute for Media Innovation. They have a little headquarters and we have a headquarters. And so we actually teach classes, as I said, in how to write computer code as well as how to write all forms of journalism. And, and the Brown Institute is supposed to make uh, things that either become the basis of media companies or uh, that get sort of plugged into existing uh, news organizations' uh, uses, like 
we're now inventing something called personalized TV news down there. Uh, well, not down there, it will be down there, which is a way of having a, a site that you go to every day that tells you what news pulled from everywhere in the world they think you want to see. So we'll be, we're, we're having a little kind of lab making stuff like that, yes. Well, the folks who do this work are here, um, and they're on the sixth floor, right up here. Uh, the year you would be here, uh, that is the construction year. So we did demolition this year, so if you want to go down and look, you'll see this big, beautiful, empty space filled with light, and we're supposed to have it ready for occupancy on July, uh, June 1st, 2014. So all the associated activities will be going on, but the actual space, you know, comes on stream next summer. Yes? Absolutely, yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, they're going on all the time. The, both the, the Tao Center and the Brown Institute have events constantly, um, and they're, they both have uh, professors, classes, research associates, fellows, and they're both, you know, kind of a beef, beehive of activity that's a little bit sort of scattered around the school uh, that, that just is, is, is not in their final headquarters space yet. So just about every week when we're in session, not just about every week when we're in session, there's some Tau Center or Brown Institute event going on in addition to zillions of other events. Yes. Sorry. If you could speak briefly about the getting rid of the different divisions and what that means for yeah. the J School. I'll, I'll speak very briefly because the next session after this is entirely devoted to that, uh, to be uh, presided over by Bill Gruskin, our academic dean who just entered the room. Um, but so uh, this is just kind of a throw to him. Um, so in the olden days when I was your age, uh, uh, there, we, we felt that we could take the industry categories in journalism and, and kind of pull them into the school and make them curriculum categories. Um, s because if you wanted to, you know, hold, make uh, journalism that took the form of video with sound, moving images with sound, that would take place in something called the broadcast industry and only in the broadcast industry. So we would have a broadcast department that would teach you how to do that. And if you were interested in print journalism, you wouldn't ever do that. So when the internet came along, um, one of the many changes, and we haven't seen the end of the changes yet by any means, was that um, if you get a job, let's say the proverbial entry-level newspaper, metro reporter, general assignment job, you're likely to be shooting still photographs, doing audio, doing video, and writing print stories. We hope not all in the same day. But the suite of skills doesn't sit inside an industry. Um, ditto, you can get a job on a, a broadcast journalism entity writing traditional print news stories for their website and not going near a camera. So to us, these, these industry-based divisions didn't make sense. So we're switching to sort of functional divisions, of which there are three, called the written word, images and sound, and audience and engagement. And Bill will explain what those all are. Um, but, it, but really, the, the founding supposition of this change is that, you know, writing words is not just about being in the newspaper or magazine industry. Uh, dealing with uh, moving images and sound is not entirely in the broadcast industry. Yes. Yeah, I, Julie should probably speak to that, but um, we, we have risen quite a lot in the 10 years I've been dean. Um, 
partly because we didn't really have a, a full dress career service office before, and we've, we've invested a lot in that over these years. Um, so we have uh, a group of full-time people. We have what we uh, believe to be the biggest career fair in the world in journalism every March. Um, so we used to be more in a world of you graduate and then you start looking for a job. It wasn't entirely that way. Uh, right now, the, the statistic we like to use is something we call definite plan plans in journalism at graduation. And that hovers at around 70%. Is that a fair number? And the reason it's this carefully worded thing is some students, believe it or not, will say, I don't want that great job you found for me on the Memphis Commercial Appeal, and instead I want to wear all black and live in Brooklyn and make a documentary film. <laughs> so uh, I know that wouldn't happen to any of you, but um, uh, we, we call that definite plans in journalism. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Roger. Uh, before I accepted my position here, um, I was asking some uh, editors uh, that I knew whether having a master's degree would uh, necessarily increase my pay upon uh, getting a job someplace like uh, master's degrees do in other professions. So I wanted to know, and they basically said no. Uh, and, um, and also they said, it's all about your clips. It's not, that's, uh, it's yeah, not that's journalism true. right now isn't about degrees. Yeah. And so I was wondering how you justify the price. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, these are, these are fair questions, but I do have good answers for them, I think, okay? <laughs> uh, journalism is not a licensed profession. It, I hope, will never be a licensed profession. So you'll never have to go to journalism school. So, and, and as in, you know, you don't have to go to business school because business isn't a licensed profession either. So the question for us is, do we add what economists would call marginal utility for you? That's the, the fair question to ask us is, what will your prospects be and your level of skill and professionalism be short term and long term if you go to the school or if you just go out into the world without getting a degree here. And, you know, we strongly believe, and most people who go here strongly believe, that the answer for the individual who decides to come here is very positive to the school. Our cost is an embedded cost of what it costs to go to any school at any Ivy League university. I say half jokingly, but only half. A Columbia Journalism School degree is the cheapest degree you can get in an Ivy League university, period, full stop, in any field. And that's because, one, we're the only journalism school in an Ivy League university. <laughs> uh, and two, we have a, uh, for almost all of our students, except for a handful, a one-year course to degree, which is pretty much unheard of, not just elsewhere at this campus, but throughout the Ivy League. So. Um, It's people, we, we have uh, basically a pass-fail system here, um, and, and that's because uh, we're not, and I like this about journalism, we're not a, a degree from the school is known and respected at, at literally in every news organization in the world, and as I said before, puts you into a network. But we're a field that works on the basis of the work you've done. so. Um, Meryl Streep went to Yale Drama School. Does she get acting jobs? Because people said, now Meryl, if you bring me that Yale Drama School diploma, I'm gonna cast you in the movie, but if you don't, no. She, she gets the jobs because she's a great actress. She'd be a great actress probably if she didn't go to Yale Drama School, but you know where I'm going with this. You, you will graduate from here with a lot of clips. Um, because we are a production-oriented school, um, we, nobody ever says, I want to see your transcript coming out of this school. They say, I want to see your work coming out of this school. And you will have work. You, you probably have work already, but you'll have more work and really good work 
when you finish the school. To, and, and that's what the people at the career fair are going to want to see from you. Um, and in addition to that, we teach you things that you know you just can't pick up on the fly on the job. Uh, journalism, I believe, is going to become a more sort of high-skilled field, less of a, as economists say, middle-skilled field as the digital revolution rolls on and there's more demand for people who know how to understand complicated subjects, use complicated pieces of equipment, have true computer science knowledge, et cetera. Just not, you know, you can just sort of intuit it stuff. So I think the, the, the case for here, as against just going out in the workplace, gets better as time passes, not less. Um, so that's, that's my answer to your question. Um, somebody over? No? Oh, OK. Um, will we be hearing from incoming dean Steve Call? Uh, incoming here. dean Steve Call uh, became the father to his fourth child about three hours ago. So, uh, so uh, his, uh, it's a very cute baby named Robert. And that is why he is not here today. I think that's a good excuse. Uh, so maybe this is a question for later or perhaps another time. But I've read a couple of articles saying that he's interested in turning Columbia's program into a two-year program. And I would assume that some people here have communicated with him about why he thinks that may be a good idea. Can you enlighten us a little yeah. bit about why he thinks First that could be First of all, if this is to happen, it's not going to happen on your watch, you know, because you're, uh, right? Um, there's been an argument about how long the course should, to degree should be at this school since 1903, and it's never ended. Uh, the case for two years is, as I said before, sort of jokingly, I mean, we're aberrational at Columbia University um, because our course to degree is so short, and we're aberrational at this class of university. And we, you know, feel we have, in an ideal world, more to teach you than can be done in a year. Um, people can take the MS and MA sequentially and stay for two years, and they always have a great experience. So we, we've kept it short um, basically as a way of reducing the price of the degree. Um, it was under debate when I came in. It's been under debate the whole time, and I don't know where this will go. And Steve hasn't said w w he, that he's made up his mind. And you know, an academic institution is a democratic institution, so faculty and so on have to vote on it. So I think he'll send up a signal by, say, spring of next year as to whether he plans to sort of push in that direction or not. But the main thing is, uh, uh, you know, this is a great institution. Um, this is, I believe, the most important institution and the leadership institution in journalism education in the world and one of the most important institutions in journalism in the world. If we weren't constantly thinking and debating about can we be better, how can we be better, what should we be, we wouldn't be a great institution. So it's highly appropriate to have these kinds of conversations. Um, and, you know, as I say, there was a debate when the school started. It was four years. It gave an undergraduate degree. When it became a graduate school, there was a big debate whether, in 1934 whether it should be two years or one year. Um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate and constantly debated question. I also want to say, and I'll stop here because I've got to let the next crew come on. Think about this whole great university. And you know, one thing that I get sort of annoyed by is the argument that all schools should size their course to degree to um, the entry level pay in the field. And if the course to degree is less than the entry level pay, forget it. So by that standard, Columbia has two divinity schools affiliated with it. It has a teacher's college, has a great architecture school, three years to degree, social work school, three years to degree, school of the arts over here, three years to degree. Almost every school at Columbia at the graduate and professional level, the co total cost of the degree is far higher, a multiple higher than the first year pay. Um, and, you know, I, I, I hate being in that argument. Um, and nobody else in our 
university and our class of universities in, in the argument. The way we like to have the argument, we're very mindful of the cost, and that's why we've kept the course to degree short, but we'd like the argument to be, how can we reduce the cost to you through financial aid? We offer the highest financial aid per student of any school at Columbia, including the business school and the law school, uh, because we believe so deeply in you know, having a diverse student body with freedom to do what they want after they graduate, and we're mindful that the cost is high. So we've, in my 10 years as dean, somewhere between quadrupled and quintupled the average financial aid grant per student. So I'm asking you to feel, I like it that the school thinks about these things, not, oh, it's threatening because I don't think it should be. Okay, now I gotta stop. Uh, so thanks a lot, and I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow morning.